Today we're out here looking at the car that has arguably defined the large luxury sedan, the Mercedes-Benz S-Class. The S-Class dates back to 1972 technically, but many argue that its history actually goes several decades beyond that. Now 2018 isn't a complete redesign for the S-Class, instead this is more of a mid-cycle refresh. So the bones of the vehicle date back to about 2014, but Mercedes has done a lot of work to try and keep this up to date and fight off some of the new entries in this segment. We have an all new Lexus LS, we have a brand new Audi A8 coming very soon, we have the recently redesigned BMW 7 Series, and then we have some brand new luxury sedans from Korea that really haven't played in the full-size sedan segment before, but now we have an all-new Genesis G90 and an upcoming Kia K900. So let's take a look around the car, dive under the hood and in the cabin and see what makes the S-Class unique and answer the question, is this still the standard of the world? Now I know that standard of the world isn't a Mercedes tagline, but I actually think it applies to the S-Class better than the brand that it originally belonged to. With the exception of a bit of a blip in the 2000s, I think the S-Class really has long been one of the best entries in this segment. The downside for the S-Class has always been that the price tag is higher than most of the other entries. So if you want the best entry, you're going to have to pay for it. Up front, we have full LED headlamps. These have very distinctive LED accent strips inside. There's a large projector lamp right in the middle and then three smaller projector lamps outboard. We also have some turning lamps well integrated into this module and they definitely do a light dance for you out on the road. Now, unfortunately in America, we don't get the better lamps that Mercedes is allowed to sell in Europe because frankly, the US has some very silly headlamp laws. Behind this section of the front, we have a radar adaptive cruise control sensor and then under this little door right here pops out the front vision camera. It keeps it nicely tucked away. Now you'll notice we have this small small circle right over there on the other side of that radar sensor. That's for the forward looking infrared camera. As you'd expect, the rest of the Mercedes grill is very large and covered in chrome. And if we zoom in above the grill, you'll notice that we actually get a hood ornament here in America. This is kind of a unique thing. Not many vehicles sold in the American market or really around the world retain hood ornaments. And this is one of the few. The market for large luxury stands in America is a little bit different than it is in Europe. So in America, the S-Class only comes in long wheelbase form. This is 206 and a half inches long in the version that we're looking at right here. There is a slightly shorter version available in some world markets. That puts the S-Class on the long side of this segment. This is notably longer, for instance, than something like a Genesis G90 and has, as a result, quite a bit more room on the inside than the G90 or something like a Cadillac CT6. Of course, if that's not enough room for you, then Mercedes will give you an even longer S-Class at over 214 inches long. So they add eight inches to the wheelbase and it gives you basically eight inches more rear seat legroom. At this point, a little bit of pricing might come in handy. The Maybach version of the S-Class starts over $150,000. However, the model that we're looking at here does not have the base engine and it does have a bunch of options inside. So the model we're looking at right here actually is only about $10,000 less than the least expensive version of the S-Class Maybach. So if you're looking at the average configuration of the S560, I'd say, and you want a little bit of extra room, just move on over to the Maybach if you can fit it in your garage. Out back, we find dual exhausts well integrated into the bumper and LED tail lamp modules with the turn signals being red. This is a styling choice, which I find a little bit interesting. I've always preferred amber turn signals. Be sure to let me know what you think about that down below. The other thing you'll notice back here is the return of the S560 logo on the trunk lid. 560 has been an iconic number for the S class over the years. The S-Class has generally been known for its powerful V8 engines and optional V12 engines, but of course, fuel economy regulations worldwide have caused Mercedes to get with the times and give us a base three liter six cylinder engine. Of course, the base engine does have twin turbos and will still give you 362 horsepower, which is an awful lot for S-Classes of the past. It'll also give you 369 pound-feet of torque. The model that we're driving is the new S560, which uses a 4-liter twin-turbo V8 to give you 463 horsepower and a whopping 516 pound-feet of torque. Like many of Mercedes' newer engines, the turbochargers are actually right here in the valley of the V, not on the outside. That helps make the engine a little bit narrower and it also helps improve turbo response. So this vehicle feels a lot more like a supercharged vehicle than a turbocharged vehicle, although it has the efficiency 
of those turbos. If that's not enough power for you, there are two more engines you can choose from. There's a four liter twin turbo V8 made by AMG that will give you 603 horsepower and 664 pound feet of torque. And if that's still not enough, there is an available six liter twin turbo V12 that produces 621 horsepower and 738 pound feet of torque. All four of those engines are mated to a nine speed automatic transmission, although the top two engines are mated to a slightly different version of that same nine speed. Now, in an interesting twist, the six liter twin turbo V12 is actually not as fast zero to 60 as the four liter twin turbo V8, and that's mainly because of the weight. Obviously, a four liter engine like this is going to be considerably lighter than that six liter V12. As you'd expect out of a luxury vehicle, front seat comfort is excellent. These seats are thickly padded. They move in a ton of different ways and actually more ways than you can even control with these door switches. So some of the controls are done in this infotainment system. Now on the downside, I do think that these seats are just a little bit less comfortable for my body shape than the seats that we find in the new BMW 7 Series. It mainly has to do with the way the seat curvature actually works in this seat versus the one in the BMW. So in this one, you can inflate and deflate this shoulder region separately from the lumbar support, but it's not quite the same thing that we see in the BMW seat that actually has more of a mechanical change in its articulation of the seat back. Of course, that said, this is still a fantastically comfortable seat, even though the competition has been putting more and more comfortable seats in their latest models. For instance, the brand new Lexus LX recently got a more than 28 weight adjustable seat. I do like the way that seat feels, but I think this is actually just a little bit more comfortable. In addition to that, we have an available massage feature right here in the dashboard. Now, this is not one of the most aggressive massages in the segment. I actually think the Lexus massage is just a little bit better than this one, but this is still one of the best in the industry. And there are a lot of selections you can choose there, including seat back heating along with the massage functionality. Now, there's no anti-fatigue seat bottom cushion like we do find in some of the competition, but the seats will inflate as you go around a corner. So as you turn to the left, it will actually inflate this right bolster to help keep you planted in the seat. And both of the front seats do that. Hopping into the back seat, I'm going to put this seat in its most reclined position. Now the model of S-Class that we're driving has the optional rear seat package, which includes this fantastic amount of recline back here. We also have an ottoman over here on the passenger side and a little footrest that pops out of the front seat. This is a very, very comfortable back seat, but there are a few drawbacks that you should know about. I'm six feet tall. If I kick off my shoes, I'm actually very comfortable. My feet are not quite touching the seat back in front of me, although I could touch it with my toes if I wanted to. And this is overall a very comfortable position. However, if you're taller than me, this still might not be quite roomy enough. So at this point, I go back to my earlier comment in the video where if you're looking for a vehicle like the S560 that we have right here at this price tag, I would get the Maybach because we get an extra eight inches of length. And that ends up being more important than you think, because if you want the reclining rear seats, if I put this back into position, you'll notice that one of the ways we get the recline is that the seat just goes backwards and forwards like you saw there. Because my hip doesn't move further rearward in the vehicle, it doesn't appear that we have as much room in this model as in the model without the reclining rear seat package. So if you want the most room in this particular package, you should get the model without this rear seat upgrade package. But if you want the most comfortable, then get the longer version. Once the front seat is all the way back in its tracks, you can see sort of the problem with the S-Class with this seat package and of course the wheelbase that we're driving right here. This front seat was adjusted suitably for a six foot five passenger. Of course, it is all the way back in its tracks, but I still only have about two inches of legroom left. And of course, more importantly than that, the footwell is very, very tight back there. Now, again, a little bit more room in the model without this rear seat package. But on the bright side, we have a lot of headroom and legroom up front and in the back. So taller passengers are definitely going to be happier in here. I have about two inches of headroom left, even though we are in the model with this Magic Sky moonroof. Headroom is something that a lot of luxury vehicles have left behind, but not the S-Class. This still has a very comfortable interior if you're gonna try and put four adult men in that are fairly tall. This is still going to be very, very comfortable. The rear seat motion is possible because of the way the front seat contorts. You can see that the headrest folds down like that so it's not touching the roof. You can also remove it so that way you can still see the side view mirrors and the seat bottom cushion tucks in so that we can get as close to the dashboard as possible. The other thing you need to know about the rear seat option on this S560 is that it does eat up some trunk space because of that refrigerator right back there. 
It is an 11 liter refrigerator and it does occupy the prime spot in this truck. So this is a 22 inch roller bag. You can stick one on either side of it, but you can't roll it right there into the middle and still fit that bag in the trunk. And because of its positioning there, it's really difficult to fit them on the side. That will just barely fit right there on that side, but you can't put one on this corresponding other side of the trunk because that's where the subwoofer for the Burmeister sound system is living. So it won't actually fit down there in the trunk over here. In addition to that, some of this trunk space is eaten up by the rear seat package because of course those seats do have a decent amount of recline, but because the hip point doesn't move, you're taking up some trunk space in order to do that. On the bright side, we do find a little bit of additional space right here under the cargo area load floor. Let's start out our interior spin right back here in the rear seat area. That's where the refrigerator is located, right there between the two rear seats. There's also a DVD player just above it for the rear seat entertainment system. In addition to the regular headrests, this rear seat package comes with those fluffy pillow headrests. We have tray tables right there made out of aluminum for each of the rear seat passengers. And you can see on the doors right there that we have basically the same controls for the rear seats as for the front seats because they move in basically the same ways. You'll see that right there on that quilted section of leather on the doors. Up front, we have four-way electric adjusting headrests that are memory linked, and then the outside portion has this butterfly feature to give you just a little bit more comfort on longer road trips. We have manual height adjustable shoulder belts on each side. Above the seats, we find what I think is my new favorite new car feature. It is this Magic Sky Control sunroof. Now, I think that Magic Sky Control is probably the silliest name I have ever heard applied to a new car gadget, but I think the technology is really cool. There's a button up here if I scoot over there right here above the rear view mirror that controls the Magic Sky Control moonroof. So if I click this button once, this is actually at full real time. You can see what happens. Click that button and this pane becomes clear. It also controls the sunroof pane right there above the rear passenger's heads. So I'll click it again to make it dark and you can see how dark that becomes and how quickly it becomes dark. This is very similar to the windows that we see on the Boeing 787 Composite Dreamliner and the rationale is basically the same. They're trying to reduce heat load but still allow some light in through this panel. Now unfortunately you cannot vary the darkness. You just choose between dark and light but I did enjoy this because in most cars, I spend most of the time with the shade completely closed. This is an electric shade right there because in strong light, especially in the summer, it kind of gives me a hot head and it's not a feeling that I really appreciate. But with this feature, you can actually leave the shade open, enjoy that feeling of openness and some light into the cabin, but not all that heat. It really is kind of a cool feature. On the downside, it's also a very expensive feature at about $5,000. As you'd expect out of a luxury car, just about every surface is covered in either leather or Alcantara, which is a faux suede product. So the pillars in the vehicle, including this front pillar, the B pillar that we saw there earlier, those are Alcantara. The dashboard deploys basically the same styling as the doors with that quilted patterning going on right there in the perforations. And you'll see that the leather actually wraps entirely behind this instrument panel. This is the other thing that's really interesting about the S-Class is this large instrument panel. Now this is not one continuous LCD across from the driver's side all the way over there to the center of the vehicle. Instead, we actually have two LCDs, but they're in the same pod. So you can actually just barely put your fingers right there behind the screen. I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see that. The leather actually wraps entirely around this area. There's ambient lighting around there, and then the LCDs appear to sort of float in that center of the dashboard. Below that, we have four large air vents. The vent controls are these knobs right here, an analog clock, controls for the quad zone automatic climate control, You'd press the menu button right here if you want to control some of the other climate control features that are not represented with physical buttons right there. Below the climate controls, we find an ashtray, 12 volt power port, a small storage area right here where we have two cup holders, a very small little compartment there, another 12 volt power port inside, and then we find the controls for the infotainment and navigation system. Things are a little bit complicated here, but we'll go over them very briefly. We have some direct access buttons to Navi, radio, media, and telephone. This button takes you over to the car screen setting interface in the Mercedes command system. This button allows you to adjust seat settings, whether that's the massage, the dynamic seat, adjust the lumbar support, etc. Auto start stop button. This toggle controls the dynamic air suspension. We can choose between individual, sport, comfort, and eco. This button allows you to raise the vehicle up. If you're going over rough terrain, you don't want to scrape something. This button activates the 360 degree camera system. Then on this side, 
We have an on-off button for the infotainment system, volume toggle, button to lower the headrests in the rear, and then a button to turn off the parking sensors. You'll notice that we have a control knob and this touchscreen area because there are three different ways of interacting with the infotainment system, which we'll see very shortly. We have this control knob. It rotates around, toggles up, down, side to side, clicks down to enter. We then have this touchpad area here, which also has haptic feedback, a direct access to the home button, a back button, and then the only track forward button in the entire vehicle. Then on the steering wheel, we have a touch controller that kind of reminds me of some BlackBerry devices. It is this small black area right here on the steering wheel. You use this and slide your finger up, down, side to side, etc., and then click down to enter. We have a return button and then a home button. Those are used basically the same way as the touchpad that is in the center console of the vehicle to interact with the Mercedes command screen. So for instance, if I toggle my finger around here, you can select those options right like that. Click passenger seat, for instance, if I want to turn on the passenger seat massage, toggle one option down and then choose that particular massage. I can also click the home button, take us back to the home screen and hit the back button to take us back there. BMW's iDrive system doesn't have quite the visual impact of this enormous Mercedes command screen, and I think the graphics in iDrive are not quite as well done as what we see in this system either. Although personally, I do find iDrive a little bit easier to interact with, especially the more modern version that has the touchscreen in it. The graphics and animations in the system are incredibly well done, but finding exactly the option you're after is just a little bit confusing at times. This system features a built-in browser, built-in Mercedes-Benz apps, of course we have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. The way that Apple CarPlay works in the system is a little bit unusual, and I'm not just talking about the interface here where we have to use this knob to rotate around the screen because of course we don't have a touch screen so we can't touch anything, uh, but the way that the touch pads also work is a little bit confusing. So for instance, if I wanted to go back on playlists here and uh, you know, browse songs, something like that on my phone, you can do it with the control on the steering wheel, but it's a lot easier actually to use the click wheel I personally found here. Now, the other thing that I find interesting is to get to CarPlay in the first place, especially if you're off somewhere else in the system, like you're adjusting your seat or viewing the navigation database or something like that, we have to hit the home screen, then you'll find Apple CarPlay right up top. So we toggle up to the top, click that, then we're in CarPlay. But if you want to adjust sound settings while you're listening to your tunes in CarPlay, you hit the home button, and then we go along to this connect option, which is not that intuitive. Then we select sound right here. Then you could adjust equalizer, fade, etc. But if we're listening to the radio, for instance, if I click on over here to the radio and then take that back down there, then if I toggle over to the right side, we have a very quick, easy access to that sound option right there to adjust equalizer, fader, etc. But we don't have that in the CarPlay menu and it's not a direct access button on the bottom screen, etc. Now you could add it to a favorite screen that would make it a little bit easier to get to, but overall I don't find the system quite as intuitive as some of those alternatives. Although I do think it's more fully featured than most of the luxury competition and this is definitely light years ahead of what we see in the Lexus LS. As you'd expect from a luxury vehicle, there are a wide variety of different vehicle features that you can adjust, but just some of the crazier ones here are panel heating. So you can see that the armrests are actually heated in this vehicle and you can adjust which ones you want to heat and not heat. You can also adjust how hot you want the air to be in your footwell. So if you're the kind of person that likes cool air on your face and a warmer footwell, you can do that in this system as well. Some of our Facebook followers asked me to comment on the energizing comfort system. Personally, I think this sounds a little silly, just like the Magic Sky Control sounds silly, but I like some of the functionality. So for instance, refresh here, this option turns on the seat ventilation. It also causes the air coming out of the vents to vary in its intensity as well as its temperature. So it'll start to blow a little stronger. You can probably hear that on the camera and then it will back off it causes sort of a breeze feature going on. I do find that refreshing. I think, I think it also helps keep you active and aware when you're trying to pay attention to the road on a long car trip. That is a little bit useful. Now, some people may or may not like the infusion of the sense into the cabin. That is something that you can turn off. The refresh mode is trying to give you sort of a beachy vibe, and then we have a warm mode, which gives you heated surfaces, yellow lighting, etc. You can also go down here to this well-being option right here. Probably the most kitschy option is this training option down at the bottom. This sort of guides you through some relaxation exercises as you drive down the road with a lot of German warnings telling you to pay attention to the road. I didn't find that too useful, but I did test it. 
The LCD instrument cluster is one of the best in the industry and it's highly configurable. We have two different zones here. So we have a zone on the left and a zone on the right. It's controlled via a toggle very similar to the infotainment system. You can choose what you want on each side. So if I hit the home button, I can, for instance, have our trip computer information over here on the left side and over there on the right side as well. I can swipe from side to side to choose those options. You can also have a navigation screen over there and, of course, any of these other options. So we can see the drive assist options right there. You can see service. You can see navigation, radio. You can also get media right there on that side if you want to. Our energizing source is playing, so I can move that up to Apple CarPlay there and play Apple CarPlay. It'll give us album art there. There's also a Bluetooth phone interface. You can change settings for the heads-up display using this screen. And, of course, we can switch the entire layout between three different looks. We have the sport look, we have the classic look, and we have the progressive look that we were seeing right there. If you choose a sport theme, you don't have to have a tachometer over here on the right. You can actually choose between a variety of different displays, including an eco display. And then we still have this area in the center, which can be used for other purposes. The steering wheel is a new design for Mercedes. It has small leather sections and then a large amount of wood on the top and on the bottom. It has a split bottom spoke right there that you can actually just about fit your hand through and paddle shifters on the back. On the left side, we find the controls for the adaptive cruise control system, as well as the controls for that display right there. So you use this to move across, select options, etc., just like the one on the right side of the steering wheel. Only these two buttons are just for the instrument cluster. These three buttons on this side are for that command infotainment system. We also have a voice command button, favorites button, volume and mute toggle, and then dedicated phone buttons over here. Keeping in mind that the S-Class can weigh well over 5,000 pounds, acceleration is still pretty good. If you get the S450, and that is the base 3.0-liter 6-cylinder model, then you go from 0 to 60 in 5.4 seconds. The model that we're driving right here is, of course, the first 4.0-liter twin-turbo V6 in the lineup, and this scooted from 0 to 60 in 4.4 seconds, which is definitely very, very quick. That's thanks not only to the engine, but also the 9-speed automatic that has a very low first gear and the fact that this is the all-wheel drive version. And the all-wheel drive version will go 0 to 60 about one-tenth of a second faster than the rear-wheel drive version because we have extra traction. What's interesting about the S-Class is that if you move up to the S65, which has that twin-turbo V12, it actually won't go that much faster than this 0 to 60. Mercedes quotes 4.2 seconds 0 to 60. Some people have been getting right around 4.1 seconds 0 to 60. That's because that model uses a 7-speed automatic transmission, not this newer 9-speed from Mercedes, because the 9-speed apparently wouldn't fit under the hood, is what I'm being told, with that longer engine design. Now, if you want to go faster than this, you can definitely do that, because the S63 will get you 0-60 to 60 more than a full second faster than this. That's BMW M3-like acceleration out of a car that weighs, you know, 2.5 tons. This is pretty impressive. Perhaps more impressive than that is the braking distance this vehicle. 60 miles an hour back to zero happens in 110 feet, which is just one foot longer than the LS500. And the LS500 is a little bit lighter and a little bit smaller than this. Unfortunately, physics have to be obeyed, so when it comes to handling, I'm going to have to give this a B. It handles fairly well, thanks to the grippy summer tires that we have on this vehicle, but it's not going to handle as well as a performance midsize sedan or your average midsize luxury sedan, for instance. That's just because of the overall curb weight of the vehicle and, of course, the softer suspension. Now, obviously, the AMG versions of the Mercedes S-Class will handle better, but even in those vehicles, Mercedes was still dedicated to delivering a luxury ride, so they're not going to be as firm as something like an E-Class AMG. So if that's what you're looking for, you're not going to find that in the S-Class. The S-Class is going to give you a softer, more comfortable ride still. Back out here on the open road, the suspension definitely soaks up all the roadway imperfections. This really floats like a cloud out on the road, but when you get into the corners, it doesn't wallow like you might expect. And that's because this is an adaptive air suspension system, so it's always trying to keep the vehicle level, stable, and of course, deliver that very comfortable ride. Some luxury sedans in this segment offer optional air suspensions. Some offer partial air suspensions where they have an adaptive suspension up front and then air springs in the rear to help load level. The S-Class has a full four corner air suspension standard and it is adjustable height. So I can press this button right here in the center console to raise the vehicle up to get a little bit more ground clearance. You know, if your stately drive needs a little bit more gravel or a bit more oyster shell on it. 
Air suspensions deliver very, very well polished rides. That's exactly what we see in the S-Class and in other vehicles in this segment that offer those full four corner varieties. But of course, if this is not enough for you, then there is the next level of suspension technology in the S-Class available, and they call that magic body control. Again, another silly name I know, but the system is actually quite interesting. It actually has a stereo camera system that is reading the road in front of the vehicle, and then it will adjust the suspension before you hit the pothole or before you hit that speed bump or whatever it is in the road that you're gonna run over. So it adds that next level of comfort, which isn't possible with a standard suspension like we're driving here. That next level of suspension technology makes the S-Class very unique in the world because this is one of the very few suspension technologies that can actually predict what's going to happen and then take action before it even happens. That gives you a very well polished ride. Now that shouldn't surprise you too much of course because depending on which S-Class you buy, this could be seen as an upgrade from something like a Lexus LS or as perhaps an alternative to a Bentley or a Rolls-Royce. So, Remember that this car can get up to nearly $300,000, depending on how you configure it, definitely over a quarter million dollars. So you do expect that level of technology up at that upper end. But even if you're shopping for a base Mercedes S-Class or one that's under $100,000, so definitely in the thick of things for the large luxury stand category in America, this is still going to give you a very, very comfortable ride. The S-Class has long been known for a quiet cabin, and that's definitely something we find in this model. At 68 decibels, this is the quietest cabin that we have ever tested. Now, you definitely get a little bit of engine noise when you want to in the cabin, so if you start romping on the pedal a little bit harder, you do get some of that engine noise in here, but overall, everything is well controlled. Even though we do have large 275 with tires in the back, road noise is especially well controlled in this vehicle. I suspect that fuel economy is not really high on the priority list for a lot of large luxury car shoppers, and if that is something that's of interest to you, then you probably want to look at something like the Lexus LS Hybrid. According to the EPA, the model that we're driving should get 21 miles per gallon, but the way that we've been driving it this week, we've averaged right around 17 or 18. If you're a little bit too happy with the pedal on the right, you could definitely get in the low teens with this vehicle, but if you're gentle with it, especially on long highway journeys, I suspect that in the 20s is definitely an achievable range for your fuel economy. Now obviously the 3 liter 6 cylinder base engine is going to give you better fuel economy than this 4 liter twin turbo V8 and there is that upcoming plug-in hybrid. The upcoming plug-in hybrid will give you some electric range, it's probably going to be right around 20 to 25 miles. And then after that you should expect fuel economy to be somewhere between 25 and perhaps 28 miles per gallon. The S-Class has all of Mercedes' latest active safety technologies. Not only does this have their latest autonomous braking system, pedestrian detection, etc., but we also have their latest lane keeping system and their latest Distronic Plus cruise control system. The lane keeping system attempts to keep you centered. We engage it with the buttons over here on the left side of me, and of course by engaging the cruise control will give you the most aggressive lane keep feature. And now we actually get lane change assistance. So very much like we see in Tesla's autopilot, if you're driving along the road and the vehicle is keeping you centered in the lane, and then there's a highway lane next to you that you'd like to enter, you turn the turn signal on, the car will determine whether there's a car in that lane using its sensors, and then help steer you into the lane in a smoother fashion. Now obviously Mercedes is telling you that you should keep your hands on the steering wheel the entire time, the system functions very much like Tesla's autopilot system in that it obviously will work if your hands are off the steering wheel. You just tap the turn signal, it will actually steer you from one lane into the other. Now this is not an autonomous driving system, so this is not like Cadillac Super Cruise where you're supposed to keep your hands off the wheel, where it actually will tell you you can now remove your hands from the wheel and it will monitor your eye motion to make sure that you're looking forward. This system is not doing that. There are so many standard and optional features available on the S-Class that I didn't bother to list all the features as we normally do on this chart. Instead, I've just given you the key price points for the various trims. The S-Class starts at $89,900, making it quite different than the other alternatives in this segment. You notice I'm calling them more alternatives rather than competitors because in my mind, most of the trims of the S-Class don't really have a natural competitor. They have lower priced alternatives, if you will. $89,900 is significantly higher than the starting price of something like the Lexus LS or even the Jaguar XJ, which you could consider competitors or alternatives, especially for the base model. If you want to add all-wheel drive to that model, it'll bring you up to $92,900. If you want the model that we were driving, which was the S560 4MATIC, that starts at $102,900, 
The model that we were driving this week was up at about $160,000. Of course, if you want the long wheelbase version, that starts at $168,600 for the Maybach version, because remember, there are those three different wheelbase lengths. In the United States, we get just the two longest versions, but elsewhere in the world, there is a slightly shorter Mercedes as well. If you want the most expensive S-Class, they would love to sell you an AMG S65, which would start at right at $230,000, essentially. The pricing structure of the S-Class, the available options, etc., make the S-Class different than the alternatives in this segment, and that's why it's frequently looked at as a benchmark vehicle. The BMW 7 Series is the arch rival of the S-Class in some ways, but it arguably plays to quite a different shopper. Arguably someone that is a little bit more budget conscious than someone that's shopping for an S-Class, because it starts $6,000 less than the Mercedes, but by the time you get up to the M760i versus the Mercedes S65, that delta has grown to over $73,000. There's a pretty big delta in terms of overall cost between the 7 Series, which is probably about as close as it will get from Europe, to the Mercedes. The 7 Series has traditionally had kind of a different dynamic than the S-Class. It's generally been the more engaging option, the more driver-centric option. Although in this latest generation of 7 Series, it has grown a great deal. It has a large and comfortable back seat, and it actually now is fairly soft and fairly comfortable as far as the suspension tuning out on the road. So in some ways, it mimics what we see going on in especially the base versions of the S-Class. The 7 Series is a little bit fresher overall because it was redesigned completely more recently than the Mercedes. The rumor mill is telling us that the S-Class will be completely redesigned soon, but it's probably not going to happen until around the year 2020, so the current version is likely going to live on for at least another two years. Next up we have the Audi A8, but we're just going to breeze quickly by this one because there is a brand new Audi A8 right on our doorstep, so it doesn't seem fair to compare it to the older model. We don't know what Audi is going to do in terms of overall pricing to the A8, but it does look like it could be a pretty serious contender versus the S-Class. Audi is going all in on that model, they've made it more comfortable, a little bit larger on the inside, and they've given it a whole host of new active safety technologies to directly compete with what we see in the Mercedes-Benz S-Class. We should know more about this in about six months to nine months. Hopefully we'll be able to get our hands on one right around that time as well. That takes us along to the other newbie in this segment, the Lexus LS. It's grown for 2018 and now has much better base performance than the base S-Class model and improved dynamics to back up that performance. The Lexus LS has always been one of the more driver-centric options in this segment, and I realize that sounds a little bit funny to some of you, but it's true, the LS has always had a very good dynamic out on the road. It's been more direct, they've really tended to focus a little bit more on driver engagement than some of the other entries, and the LS feels a little bit smaller, a little bit tighter. But of course, that small and tight feeling does apply to the back seat as well, because we don't find nearly the same kind of room that we see in the Mercedes-Benz S-Class. It's likely that the Lexus is going to be more reliable long term. It's also going to be less expensive to acquire, starting $25,000 less than an S560. That means that depending on exactly how you want to compare the LS to the S-Class, you actually could buy a Lexus LS and a Mercedes-Benz CLA for the price of an S560 when comparably equipped. The S560 really is the more appropriate competitor in many ways to the LS500 because the overall performance level of those two vehicles is more or less the same. The S450 is going to be slower than the LS500. Of course, the really big difference between the two models, especially when you're looking at the model that we were driving with all of the interior upgrades, is that the Lexus LS is not going to feel as premium as the Mercedes. Instead of cross-shopping your S-Class down market, you might be considering cross-shopping your S-Class up market, comparing it against something like a Bentley Flying Spur. While that may seem crazy on the surface, keep in mind that the Bentley Flying Spur starts at around $189,000 and that is definitely within the upper price limits of the Mercedes-Benz S-Class, so it is logical that people could be making this comparison. In this comparison, we see something similar to comparing the Mercedes to less expensive vehicles out there. Because although the interior of the Mercedes is a lovely place to spend your time and it is expertly crafted, the Bentley Flying Spur takes things to the next level. But obviously, you're going to have to pay for that additional refinement. This is logical, again, because the Flying Spur starts $100,000 higher than a base Mercedes model, so they can afford to make some of those parts and bits and bobs in the cabin more premium, even in that base trim. You get a lot more ability to customize your vehicle over on the Bentley than you would on the Mercedes, although, again, customization is quite high on the Mercedes as well. 
And of course, if the Flying Spur is a little bit too pedestrian for you, there are other Bentley models to choose from, but they will set you back hundreds of thousands of dollars more than the Maybach. So in some ways, the S-Class, especially the Maybach, could be looked at as sort of the discount alternative to a Bentley or a Rolls-Royce. If your pockets aren't that deep, you might be looking at an alternative like the Jaguar XJ sedan. The Jag starts considerably lower than the Mercedes. It's actually priced right around the same as the base LS500 at about $75,000 starting. You can choose between three different engines, 340 horsepower, 470 horsepower, or 575 horsepower if you happen to have $122,000 laying around. That's a much narrower window than we see in the Mercedes-Benz S-Class, and if you fully load your Jaguar XJ, the highest you can get it is right around $130,000. So it definitely is more of a value alternative to the S-Class than a direct competitor. The interior is well put together, but it's not put together with the same level of luxury gadgets and gizmos and trappings that we see in the Mercedes. That's the odd thing about the S-Class. It lives in this weird in-between, between the average full-size luxury sedan, like the Jaguar XJ, the Audi A8, the BMW 7 Series, the Maserati Quattroporte, even vehicles like that are somewhere together below the Mercedes-Benz S-Class. But the S-Class isn't quite at the same level as the Bentleys and Rolls-Royce. If I had the cash and I was choosing between vehicles in this segment, I would say in my head it would be a tie between the extreme value that we find in the Genesis G90, that's a very, very well put together vehicle, or the well-rounded nature of the BMW 7 Series. Those would be my top two picks. But if it's a question of what's the best entry in this segment, then I would say unquestionably it has to be the Mercedes. But is the Mercedes even in the same segment as the G90 or the 7 Series? I would say it's not in the same segment as the Genesis, and whether it's in the same segment as the 7 Series or not is a pretty big question open to debate. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. Be sure and click that subscribe button down there if you haven't already done so, and of course click up at the top of your screen if you want to support this channel. I'll see you next week.